Olha, olha que jovem ele é. Look what he brought, said the time. <laughs> okay, scripture reading this morning, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 18. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will be certainly <clears throat> not be preceded those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangels and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So be it. Find your little earmark. <coughs> what was the last hymn number you sang, Debbie? 245. 245. I had in my head 425. No wonder I'm in the wrong place. Is <laughs> very good. What if it were today? You're going to get all the answers today. We covered Revelations 19 to 22, right? So I'm going to tell you all about the millennium reign and all that. I'm going to tell you that Jesus is coming again. We don't need to know the times or the seasons or anything else, and Jesus is clear about that. And I am going to talk a little bit about it. And when I do, I'm not making fun of or anything. I'm going to tr give you different ideas and tell you not to miss the point again that Jesus is to come and just like this song said Jesus is coming to earth again what if it were today Satan dominion will be no more faithful and true he, fi he would find us here that's the thing will he find you faithful will you be ready will you be serving or will that day come upon you like a thief that's what we're going to talk about in Revelations 19 to 22. And if you've been reading along, you should also have started reading 2 Timothy and see Paul's final words to Timothy so that he will fan in the flame of his faith, that he will not depart from it. And then we're going to read through the Gospel of John and John's three letters, and you're going to see how the, the son of Zebedee the, wanted to draw down thunder from heaven to destroy people, and now he's talking about loving people instead until Jesus Christ returns because he's un got the picture and understood what God has done for him through the love of Jesus Christ that no man, no greater love a man would have but to lay down his life for his friends. So let's start with prayer and then we'll dig into Revelations 19 to 22. Father in heaven, we do come before your throne today as we celebrate this first week of Advent season. As we understand that prophecy was fulfilled many years ago, that just at the right time when it seemed dark and dismal, but just at the right time, you sent your only son, and he died for the ungodly, for his enemies. That he came into Jerusalem, announced his king as the Messiah, but done by the mighty works of God that, to make this known to people, but people didn't want him to be their king. They wanted a king, they wanted a savior that fit into their plans and their needs. They didn't want a savior that said, forsake everything and come and follow me. To deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow after me. And Lord Jesus' words are clear. He tells us to be that good and faithful servant so that we will be ready on that day and we will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. As we study your word today, Lord, have your spirit speak to us. Help us to realize that this life is not our own. It, you are the one that created us and you are the one that brought up, purchased us back from an eternity apart from you. Lord, we give you all glory and praise and honor for you are worthy of all glory, praise and honor. 
we thank you and praise you. Open up our eyes to see and our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I had Merle read to you from 1 Thessalonians because it talks about that day when Jesus comes. And we're going to look at Revelation. We're going to look at some of what Peter said. So I've got a question for you first. This is simple math. Uh, we don't have any youngsters in here, but we've got young at heart, right? A thousand or forever? Which one is greater? Simple math problem, right? Greater. So why do we concentrate so many times on when the rapture will come, how it will come, the millennial reign, how that will be, when the end result is, is I will be with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. Amen. Revelation 19 to 22. But first, why did God create man? To know him, to know God's love, to love him, to thank him, to trust him, to worship him, to serve him, to tell others about him, and to live a life with fellowship with Him and fellowship with others where we understand and love because God first loved us. And there is no way that we can understand that love until we know the love of Jesus Christ on the cross. Blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt and know that there's no way that they can come to God except by faith in Jesus Christ alone. That they are destitute, bankrupt because of their sins. But because of God's love, if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you will have eternal life. So if you believe that, are you living that as Jesus Christ were coming back today with urgency, that you have a mission, that you have a, a calling, that you are equipped and empowered, that you are an ambassador of Christ so you should live as a foreigner and an alien in this world. Genesis 1.26 says that God created mankind. He said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our own likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that moved along the ground. God gave us a thought process, a choice, and he gave us a responsibility to rule over this world before sin ever came. What a responsibility we have even now, knowing that because of sin we are separated from God and there's nothing we can do except proclaim Jesus Christ. That should be our, our foremost objective, is to live a life where our light shines before men, they see our good deeds, and it glorifies our Father which is in heaven. Psalms 8, verse 1, Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. They declare the glory of God, all the brilliance of the stars and billions and billions of galaxies, and they follow the command of God simply at His breath. Do you follow God's command? Verse 3 says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Do you thank God each and every day for His wonderful grace of oxygen, for your heart beating, for, for everything else in your life, let alone your family, friends, and the many riches that you have in this world? Psalms 9, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name most high. Psalm 100, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful song. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, that we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Do you follow the shepherd's voice? 1 Samuel 12, 24, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your hearts. Consider what great things He has done for you. And this is when there was only a hope of the Messiah coming the first time, let alone Him coming the second time and being forever with you. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every good deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Now to the New Testament. Jesus replied in Matthew 22, verse 37, What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandments. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. 
I am going the, over these verses so that you'll think about this as you're reading Revelation and examine your own life because Jesus wrote or gave John this vision so that he would write it down and present this to the churches who were being persecuted at whatever time that it was written. He didn't want them to fall short. He didn't want them to not hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. He commended them for the things they did right and told them what things they were doing wrong so that that day would not catch up on them like a thief. Whether it's pre, mid, post, <laughs> however the tribulation, however the millennium is. In Romans 5, 8, and 9, but God demonstrated his love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? You all face God's wrath because of his sin. Sometimes, I know I do, I contemplate it all the time. I, I haven't seen the smoke bellow up from Mount Sinai and tremble in fear, thinking that I was just going to get burnt up and obliterated in God's presence. Because I know Jesus Christ. I don't have to fear that. But yet I want to know that somewhat, somewhat, <laughs> because I think that I don't have a fathom of how holy God is and this sal how great this salvation is. I don't tremble in fear so much. But because of God who is, well, everything that He is, I need to know somewhat what fear is so that I can understand this wrath that I have been saved from. I was to face God's wrath forever and ever and ever and ever. And John tries to describe some of that in Revelation, but he can't describe it with words from mankind. He can't even begin to describe it. So I have to sit here and just say, I, I can't understand and fathom it all, but I thank you, O oh God, that I am yours, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, and I will follow the Lamb. Increase my faith. Give me boldness to proclaim your message. Help me to not be adulterous, but to be spotless when Jesus comes. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, uh, or 9 through 11 but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful, wonderful light. Dear friends, I urge you then as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Do you realize the battle that you're in? Each and every decision you make when you don't thank God, when you think of yourselves in your own power and your own might, are you denying God of who He is? We should be constantly praying, praying without ceasing, thanking Him for everything that He has given us in the rain and in the sunshine, in the sickness, in the health, in the good times and in the despair. Romans 8, verses 16 to 25. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. <laughs> Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. I consider that our present sufferings aren't worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That is what's going to happen on the day, no matter how the events lead up to it. The children of God will be revealed. There will be a separating of sheep from goats. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth from those who thought that they were going to spend an eternity with God, but instead spend an eternity apart from Him. What if it were today? Will you be ready? Will you be found spotless as He comes? For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope there's our candle today, that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who, who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, then we wait patiently for it. Revelation chapter 19. 
I hope I set up a little bit so that maybe you think a little differently, and I've tried to each time so you don't look for those specific answers and try to figure this out. There's a lot of imagery in Revelation. There's a lot of going back and forth in the story, but we know the end of the story. We, we, we know, we've known it for 2,000 years, and the Old Testament saints knew that before that, and that's why they were accounted righteous for trusting in God and living in the hope that they had that the Messiah would come. And Jesus Christ will come again. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that when he returns, you can be with him where he is forever and ever and ever. The epic story goes back and forth, and it looks like for sure with the different beasts and the, and the serpent and everything else that they are going to destroy the child. But no way. <laughs> Satan has already been destroyed. He's already been bound. He has no power and dominion in your life whatsoever. You can say to the devil, flee from you. You are a child of God. He resides in you. Your body is the temple of God. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit as his child. Don't let Satan try to deceive you in any way. Chapter 19 opens up with what sounds like a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has con condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Praise to God from all of heaven for his perfect, amazing, saving grace and his perfect judgment. One of the things the world doesn't understand is, is if there is a loving God, how can he let this happen? And how could he let anyone go to hell? He constantly, patiently does everything in his power to draw people to him, and he uses you as his child to do that. Jesus said, greater things will you do than he did, the miracles that he did. You are called to be a light in this world. So that means that you've got to set yourself apart from the world. You've got to not have those idols in the world. You've got to focus and fix your eyes on Jesus and run this race together with, with stripping away anything that can entangle you. There are two results of the outcome of mankind because this is the story of God and the story of man. We don't need to know the story of cherubims and angels and other things. I mean, we get some glimpses there. But this is a story of mankind and God's love for them. And there are two outcomes. Those that will spend an eternity with God and those that will spend an eternity apart from God. Because they will die condemned in their sins or they will die being purchased back from their sins, being an adopted child. The difference is the faithful will go to eternal life and the adulterous will go to eternal death. Again, we hear what sounds like a great multitude from heaven shouting out in verse 3, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Whether you take this literal or you don't take this literal. I take it literal. Because if I'm going to spend forever in, in eternity in heaven, then I think the judgment is forever. But it doesn't matter. We don't have to worry about that. We focus on the end. Then a voice comes from the throne. Whose voice? It doesn't say. We don't know. Some speculate and say it's Jesus. It doesn't sound like it from this. It says, praise our God. And that's why I don't think it's Jesus, our God, because Jesus is God. He's not an angel or anything else. He is God himself. Scripture is clear of that. Praise our God, all you servants, who, you who fear him, both great and small. The point is, is redemption is coming. We praise God for his amazing, saving grace and for his perfect judgment that no one will die without God being just, that he does anything and everything he can to draw them to him, including sacrificing his own son. And all you have to do is come with childlike faith and accept Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to figure out everything in Revelation. Then there's what sounds like the voice of many rushing waters. And what also sounds like the voice of mighty thunder, verse 6, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. I'm going to say that again. And her bride has made Himself ready. 
Whatever, again, you think the bride exactly means, whether it's the church or whether it's Jerusalem, whether it's the, the nation of Israel, whether it's all believers, the bride has made herself ready. So I have to think, okay, I'm a groom, not a bride, but I can think of that day and how my bride prepared for that day. Wow, I just smile on my face. The, the joy that was there, the amount of preparation that was there, what a glorious day that would be. Is that how you see when Jesus Christ returns? Is that what you're living for for that day? Look, think about that example. As that bride so expectantly waited for that day, and that goes back to her childhood when she, when she dreamed of that day. And she put on dresses as a little girl, how she would look at, on that day of her wedding. Is that how you look at the day that Jesus Christ will return and claim you for His very own? And what great salvation this is that you escape the wrath of God. And how can you not tell others about it? You send out wedding invitations, don't you? You have to continually say, well, wait a minute, we need to mark that off a few of the list because otherwise I'd have everybody in the world invited. Well, let's invite everyone to this wedding feast, right? We're going to get to chapter 22 in a minute and it says, come. We're to give out invitations to that wedding. Verse 8, fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Now, if you compare these back a few chapters to 17, verse 1, the great prostitute, not the bride, stands or sits, rather, on many waters. But see, these waters are rushing waters with a sound of thunder because they're going to overcome the, the, those who chose adultery who thought that the ways they were going was, was good enough. They thought for sure the beasts would kill and the dragon would kill this child, but that's not the case. <clears throat> there are a multitude of voices calling out from heaven, whatever these beings are, whoever these people are, the elders, the, wh whatever, praising God for His amazing saving grace and His righteous judgment. Verse 9. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's pivotal in Revelation. Will you be invited? On that day will you attend or will you stand outside knocking as Jesus said? And Jesus said the door is shut, you can't come in. Will you be one who th got in? I don't know how that works exactly, but then you didn't have on the right garments and you get cast out. Or will you be dressed, prepared for that day, in white, faithful and true, knowing that you will spend an eternity with God because of your faith in Jesus Christ? Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And then he added, these are the true words of God. And that takes me to all other scriptures about I know that Jesus Christ will return. I know these words are true. No one can tell me, make me doubt my faith, anything else. I, my faith is firmly grant, grounded in Jesus Christ. Even though I can't see it, I can see the heavens and they declare the glory of God. And I'm going to declare his glory because I know what Jesus Christ has done for me. So a thousand years or forever, it's a simple math problem. Are you going to focus on things like the millennial reign? Or are you going to focus on the end of the story? Is a thousand years literal? Is it a long time? Who goes into the millennium? When does it happen? Or are we going to focus on our objective to be a light to this world because the day is coming when you will spend an eternity with Jesus or you will spend an eternity apart from Jesus? So let's keep reading. Four times, though, and six verses coming up, or in six verses here, Hallelujah for our Lord God omnipotent. Now maybe yours doesn't say it. Reigns. God is in control of all things. He is the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the ruler of all things. His ways are perfect. His ways are higher than yours. You are bought with a price and you are called to serve Jesus Christ, to be His hands and feet, to go and spread the good news of Jesus Christ and to train up disciples. Then... A rider on a white horse comes out of heaven. Verse 11. Whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him. 
riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, coming out of his mouth a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders, and the flesh of the people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on whose... Uh, the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it, with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Two of them were thrown, the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with a sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horses. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh." Okay, now when I get to chapter 20, I'm going to have to decide if this is a retelling of these events or what this is. But what can I dig out of this? That Jesus Christ will return. That He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That anything else that is your King, that is your Lord, get rid of it now. Come out from it. Get rid of those idols. The great prostitute, the way of the world, your, your freedom the government, whatever things, your family, your job, whatever things you're holding on to as idols, put your faith and trust in God alone through Jesus Christ. He is the one who commands angels, angel armies. The angels have been sent out as messengers. If you notice from reading, the angel armies don't even fight. The breath of God simply, just like He gives life, takes life away and destroys. God is that omnipotent. And if the stars obey, if the angels obey, then who am I not to obey? Who am I to prostitute myself with something else? The winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty is coming. The war, those who don't understand this, who don't have the, their names written in the book of life, they will be destroyed along with everything else in this world that is cursed because of sin. Was this the final battle of Armageddon? Was this the beginning of the millennial reign? I don't know. I'm focusing on the end. <clears throat> there are those who wear the name of Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes and the abomination of the earth. That's from Revelation 17 verse 5. They will try and wage war against those who wear the name of the Lamb, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's where we just read from Revelation 19, 16. Jesus gives this revelation to the seven churches because some of them are doing good. Majority, five out of seven, need some improving. But there's going to become a time of more testing. Physical churches that are going to face more physical testing. We, had, we don't face persecution. So what is the testing on your faith that's coming? Is it right now just your complacency and your comfort? And what about the day when it changes and when you will face, because each of you think those days are coming the way things look, when you will be really persecuted for your faith? Stand up for Jesus as if today were the day that He were coming. <clears throat> Revelation 16, 14 to 16 they are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Look, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remain clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. How many times does Jesus have to warn the church himself? Be ready for that day, dressed and serving. Verse 16, then they gather the kings together to the place that is in Hebrew called Armageddon. So we've already read these different things. In Revelation 17, verses 9 to 14, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is the other. One is the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. 
The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king who belongs to the seven and is going, going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not, received a, not yet received a kingdom, but for one hour will receive authority as the king along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. We could go and try to explain all that, or we understand that the kings and kingdoms of this world which we belong to another kingdom, we belong to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. They think differently than we do. They are headed for God's wrath and it's us, up to us to live as the children of the kingdom of heaven so we can invite them to come to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And how can we do that if we're hypocrites? How can we do that if we're not living a life as a child of God? They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the Lamb. But the Lamb will triumph over them because He is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. So if we know that, are we fighting this battle with Jesus today? Especially as if today were the last day. And then in verse 19, chapter 19, verse 16, And with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. I don't know how it plays out again, but I know that I will be with Jesus when the day comes and I will spend eternity with Him. <clears throat> Chapter 20. We do not need a lot of wisdom to figure this out unless we try to figure it out. And then you got, need more wisdom than you possibly can have. And it's funny when, that's why I said don't think that I'm mocking, but when it's preached as a fact, this is the way it's going to happen, because if you look and go to a different church, it's preached how this is a fact that's going to happen, and the two don't jive. And history doesn't teach the same thing in the church. It's whatever is popular in the church teaching in that day. So don't be distracted, as we see in many letters to many churches, about different teachings in the church. Stay focused on your mission to set yourself apart from this world, to live such godly lives that when people ask you about your faith, whether they are trying to kill you or just come casually and ask you about it, that you can proclaim to them the good news of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Those who serve faithfully and patiently, no matter what, will come to a good end. What John is saying is not necessarily in chronological order. You've got to understand the, the, the symbolism, which you can't understand at all. The disciples didn't understand. That's why they asked Jesus the, the day that he was departing, are you going to now restore the kingdom of Israel? The, the nation of Israel didn't understand. They, they saw the mighty works of God, and as Jesus came in, um, on Palm Sunday, they shouted, Hosanna, King of kings, save us. But then on Friday, they were yelling, crucify him. So before we get into Revelation chapter 20, I want to go back to 2 Peter and see what Peter wrote. I'm in chapter 3, verse 7. By the same word, the present heaven and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, what... With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness, slowness, slowness. Instead, He is patient with you. Why? Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. A thousand years or not. But the day of the Lord will come, and it will come what? Like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the, and, and the earth and everything done it will be, be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed up its coming. That day will bring about the destructions of the heaven by fire and the elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since 
You are looking forward to this. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. I hope you can see why I read Peter's words first. He mentions a thousand. Whether you've got to figure out this thousand year reign and see when it happens and whether it's literal or, literal or not. And he told you that a thousand years is like a day, so don't try to figure it out. He also said that since this is happening, how should you live your lives? Holy and godly. So you know that, that God's patience, whether it's a thousand literal years, some long period of time, whenever it is, that day will happen. And that patience that God is having is so that you can tell others about Jesus Christ so hopefully they will be saved instead of spending eternity apart from, from God and whatever your thought process is of hell. I don't know what hell is like. But I know it will be the absence of everything that is from God. I cannot fathom that. No light, no love, no healing, no friends. I mean, one of the craziest things I ever he heard in, in youth was, well, at least my friends will be there. <laughs> Nothing good. Nothing. Facing God, His wrath. Because you simply wouldn't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And if you profess with your mouth, but your heart's far, far from Him, then you probably will be weeping and gnashing that day. So, when you think about the millennium reign, or millennial reign, there's premillennium, or premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial. I don't know if you know that or not. I don't know what you've been taught. Doesn't matter. Premillennial wasn't even taught until the 1700s, and that's traditional pre premillennialism. Okay. And then in the 1900s, we have dispensational millennialism. Okay, teaches a little different, but that says that Jesus Christ comes before the thousand years and, and he reigns. And I read a lot on this this week besides scripture. And I'm just like, I'm so confused when I get through. So the, the, the saints that died before come back and they've got their redeemed bodies, but people die during that time. So those can't die. And I, there's some scripture that backs it up, but maybe they just live a long time, but then do die. Well, wait a minute, how do they die again? And if, if the people that enter into the millennial kingdom are only saved, then it's got to be just their children. Wow, how terrible that would be to have children and know that they might die and not know Jesus Christ. I not, don't know your ways, God. I'm not going to try to figure this out. I'm just going to stay focused on the mission. Because if I start looking at this, uh, yeah, okay. Postmillennialism. After the thousand years of the godly period, because the church has done a good job, then Jesus will return and reign. Amillennialism, it's only imagery. Jesus won't physically reign. I don't get that one either, because there's a lot of Old Testament prophecy that Jesus will reign. But it could be spiritual kingdom, and what if the church lived like they're supposed to today? Would he not be reigning in this world? It just got to make you think. I don't know, but I know the end, and I know there are two types of people, those who spend an eternity with God and those who spend an eternity apart from God. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast. So I tend to look more at the rest of the story. Satan will be released, and he will deceive again, but the day will come. When those who follow him, they'll gather to war thinking they have hope. Revelation 20, verse 9 through 15. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown in the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. We, we already see that. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I get it that again. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were open. Another book was open, 
which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Every thought, every deed. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the dead in Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was, ju was judged according to what they had done. So how can I live a life proclaiming that I know Jesus Christ, that He's my Savior, and not live for Him? Wouldn't I be the biggest hypocrite in the world? Woe, woe, woe to me. If I believe and God gives me His Spirit to reside in me and the Spirit will transform me as I separate myself apart from the world and devour God's Word, He will make me into the image of Jesus Christ then how will it, can I not live for that process today? And it means a constant reading God's Word, a constant denying myself, a constant time in prayer, a constant time spending my time with one another, a constant time doing the things of the kingdom rather than the things necessarily that I had planned to do. Verse 14, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Chapter 21. Then John saw, get this, a new heaven and a new earth. Just like Peter said. A new heaven and a new earth where there will be nothing but things that are good because of everything that is sin is gone away. And it won't be like the Garden of Eden where we'll fall again. We have been totally sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Wow. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away, just like Peter said. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. What a glorious, glorious day that will be. John does his best to try to explain. John gives the revelation to the church. But stay focused on this was a revelation to seven churches so they would be ready for that day with a sheet given to them saying, look at these things. I've done a performance evaluation. You need to see how this is going because I don't want you to not be ready for that day. Will you be ready? Okay, so that's the last chapter in Revelation, right? No, there's another one. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as, crystal, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of that great city, street of that city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life. Okay, I'm thinking back to Genesis this, well, there's, wait a minute, each side, there's two trees, uh, and they bear 12 crops of fruit, 24 different kinds, right? Two times, simple math again, 12 is 24, before there was one. Wow, so much better, and 1 to 24, I'm telling you, the ratio is going to be so much better than that. Words can't describe, thoughts cannot imagine the things that God has prepared for you, His children. Twelve, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will be no, there, they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign, what? Forever and ever and ever and ever. Are you ready for that day? Are you going to be found a good and faithful servant? 
Are you living today as if today were the day that Jesus Christ were coming again? Regardless of what you've been taught about pre-trib, mid-trib, so forth. Verse 12. Your Bible may have these words in red. Look, I am coming soon. How many times does Jesus have to tell these words to the churches? My reward is with me, and I will give each person according to what they have done. So we see the new heaven, the new earth. We see that everything will be made perfect, and there's still this written after that from Jesus' mouth. My reward is with me, and I will give each person according to what they have done with this good news of salvation. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to, to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practice falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. There we go. I am the root and the offspring of David and the br bright morning star. Verse 17. The spirit and the bride. I'm going to put myself in with the bride. Not because I have a identity crisis or anything, but because of what Scripture tells me to prepare for that. So I think of that wedding day again, and I'm going to be ready and dressed and waiting. And the Spirit and the bride say, because the Spirit lives inside of me, I am God's child ready and waiting for that day, so I have got to tell the world, come. It's my job. From cover to cover, from the beginning where God created man in His image to, uh, to the end, we are told to tell of God's great love. Not only by thanking Him and worshiping Him and singing songs to Him and being obedient to Him, but by telling others with our mouth and how we live so that they may come. To the ones that hear, say, come, come. Let the ones who are thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. Isn't that what the Spirit is telling you to do? Are you ready for that day? What if today were the day that Jesus comes? Hopefully you've started reading 2 Timothy, and you see that Paul warns Timothy not to fall away but instead to fan in that flame of the Holy Spirit so that that fire ignites and extinguishes everything else and refines Him as pure gold. That nothing else can come in because that flame is burning so bright that it will just be extinguished so that He will live His life as a light to a church that Jesus has to cry out to later and say, you've fallen out of love with me. What will you do? What will you give for this salvation? Will you pass on? Will you feed that flame and will you pass it on to who and whoever you can? Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you for you are a God so worthy of praise, glory, and honor. Your ways are so much higher than mine. I thank you that you have revealed the secrets of the kingdom of heaven to children who simply come to your arms and say, Daddy. Oh, the depravity of our sins, but the greatness of your grace. Help us to be bold. Empower us by your Spirit. Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know you, let today be the day that they come to know Jesus Christ. And any that have anything standing in the way of worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords with everything that they have, Lord, let this be the day that they give those things to the King, including our love for one another, Lord, even our enemies. 
that on that day we will be spotless, ready and serving in white to meet the groom. Father, we thank you that we know that your words are true as we celebrate this first Sunday of Advent that we know without a doubt that Jesus Christ is coming. And Lord, we pray that he is coming soon. We pray this in his name. Amen.